right. Well, I wanted to, uh, before Pastor Paul preaches this morning, we, you know, we've done a seven days of prayer with fasting that we call Renewal Week. We do it twice a year, and we just like to start the year off right uh, with prayer with fasting. And so every morning on Zoom, we've been praying, and every night of the week, we met here at 7 o'clock and prayed together. And uh, it was good. This has been a yeah. really, really good week. I think it was a good week to, to have this. So um, I just wanted to kind of, kind of before Pastor Paul speaks, just pray again over over our church um, and and for the upcoming year. So Father God, I just thank you for where you have us right here, right now in this place. God, we know that that you have called us here for a reason. There's a purpose for our church. There's a purpose for every person in this room to be here, God, and that is to, to live our yes. lives for you, God. And Lord, I just pray that this year you would show us exactly how to do that. Lord, show us how we should grow. Show us uh, things that we that, that things that we need to drop aside and put aside and things that we need to focus on for you, Jesus. Lord, I just pray for, for peace and uh, comfort in our lives, God for uh, the, the ability to, to live our lives in this time that is difficult with your grace, God, and your peace. In Jesus' name, we give you all the glory and all the honor. Amen, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. And how's everybody doing? Doing all right? It's been a, a really good week. I, I, I know we shouldn't compare, and I, I, I don't know that there's any way to compare, uh, but I would I would say that, my heart and body and soul were all into this this week, probably more than any other session, any time that we've had of prayer and fasting. And I'm, I'm just grateful. I know that the Lord is speaking, and uh, I want to share with you uh, well, some of the things that, uh, or that what I'm sharing this morning came from uh, some of our time here this week, and so. I hope that it'll be a blessing and encouragement to you. How, how many of you could handle just a tad of encouragement? You know, by the way, Tim, I just appreciate the way you get up here and, and greet everybody and make announcements. He's got that excitement in his voice. And so I just, every now and then I pray, Lord, just uh, let, let a little bit of that, let a little bit of that Tim get off on me. You know, he gets really with it. And uh, I always wanted one of those personalities, you know. I wanted to be God's man of faith and power, come in. And I just wanted, you know, when I was an evangelist, they would tell me, you're going to be a pastor someday. And that would make me so mad because I wanted to be a fireball evangelist. I, just so it, people would kind of tremble a little bit when you speak. Uh, people don't tremble when I talk. Yeah, people uh, fight, fight off sleep when I talk. And so, but uh, now that I've encouraged you with how boring this is going to be, let me jump into the word. <laughs> Talking about being in the face of God, and uh, this scripture came to us. Delia and I were uh, sharing. She actually shared it with me, Psalm 27 and 8. And it's a powerful word. I mean, it's a re re really wonderful word. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. So the psalmist is in this conversation with God, and God extends to him this invitation, seek my face. And, and he says, you know, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to seek your face. And so we started talking about it, and um, that Delia said, you know, what does that mean to seek God's face? We've always sought the Lord, but what does it really mean to seek God's face? Well, the Hebrew word face, or which is translated face many times. It's also translated, same word, translated the presence of God. So if we are seeking the face of God, that means that we are seeking his presence. And when we are seeking his presence, we are not just wanting a feeling, but we're wanting the knowledge of his word to be alive and real to us. Because God's presence, God's revelation of himself uh, involves body, soul, and spirit. And, you know, I think that we're learning more and more to pray, uh, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. You know, so many times we pray, Lord, let my will be done. 
Lord, I know exactly what we need. I know, oh, Lord, let my, and he, does, he says, no, pray thy will. Pray your will be done. So we see throughout the scripture many passages talking about seeking the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah 29, this is a, a scripture that many of us know, uh, for where he says, for, I, for the thought, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. But sometimes we forget about verse 12. <laughs> and he says, then you will call upon me and you will go and pray to me. Sometimes we need to go and pray. We need to go, which means we need to get into a, a different place. Go and pray to me. I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search me with all of your heart. All of your heart. And then Moses, during a time when he is reminding the people of God about the promises of God, Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, he actually says things that are going to befall you and things you're going to fall into. As a matter of fact, he even says to them, you're going to become, you're going to fall into idolatry. You're, going to, you're actually going to get to a place where you serve other gods. And uh, a lot of calamity and disaster is going to come your way. But, but look at verse 29. But if from there, if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. God's saying, there's nothing that you get into that is beyond the reach of my grace and my mercy. This is the Old Testament. How much more this side of Calvary when Jesus is here? And Jesus has come to pour out. He has come full of truth and mercy. He has come. Y'all, Jesus made a huge difference. And he says to me, you know, if you just turn to me, I'm there. Paul to the uh, Athens, uh, Athenians on Mars Hill. If you will just perhaps seek the Lord, you will find him because he's not far from any of us. And, of course, Matthew 6, 33 is another one. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. He said, don't worry about what you will drink, what will you will wear, what you will eat. Don't worry about those things. He says, if you seek first my kingdom, I'll make sure that all of those things are taken care of. Huge stuff. That's big stuff right there. That is big stuff. But we found it to be true, haven't we? I mean, if you tried that out, you found it to be true. Sometimes we get our tail in the crack, or, or that was really not a good expression, but sometimes we get, uh, um, well, I'm just thinking, if you were a dog or a cat, I'm speaking to the animals right now, you know. We get ourselves in a fix. Uh, how many of you have ever been in a fix before? I mean, where you just could not fix it yourself. And you said, oh, man, oh, man, this is, uh, this is such a mess. God, this is such a mess, 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 mess everywhere. But he says, if you call to me and search me with all of your heart, I seek first the kingdom, some good stuff's going to happen. You know, the early church was facing tremendous persecution. Uh, just right after the day of Pentecost, maybe a few days or weeks after that, Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. There's a man there that is lame he's asking for money and peter says uh, he says uh, silver and gold i do not have but what i do have i give to you in the name of jesus christ rise up and walk and the guy was immediately healed well the church rejoiced and a lot of the people rejoiced uh, but the authorities did not like that that they were preaching in the name of jesus and so they actually arrest them and and they're threatened by the authorities, and they're told, don't mention that name again. And Peter says, well, <laughs> don't tell me. Not. I, I've got to obey God rather than man. You know, if you've read that, you know that story. Let's go to the 23rd verse, because I just want to walk through this time that the church is seeking the Lord. Let's just walk through this. There's some really good stuff in here. And he says, on their release, 
Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God, Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Do they acknowledge the magnificence of God, the sovereignty of God, the power of God? What's outstanding about this particular passage is that I would say that for the most part, people were not just sitting around twiddling their thumbs to find out what would happen to Peter and John. These are people, probably for the most part, working class people, and they, they had jobs, they had families, they had vocations, they had stuff to do. But the Bible says that when they heard, they gathered. When they heard, they came together, and they came together with prayer, for prayer. They have all these activities going on, and you know, life continues as, as somewhat as normal even after Pentecost. But when they heard that they had been released, that John and Peter had been released, they get together in united prayer. And so they pray with one voice. Now, I'll give you my idea as to how they did this. And that is that uh, we, we have here, we hear here, that they lift up their voices together and, uh, and pray together and uh, but perhaps this is how it happened. Perhaps somebody stood up and just m one of the leaders and gave the initiative. And this is what they said. Lord, we, we want to, we, we remember in your word what you have shown us. And we give you praise. Because, so he's, he's, the whole prayer that is prayed here is because somebody has kind of set the, set the course and then they all pray over that. Uh, I think I saw this in action probably the greatest way in, in Ghana, West Africa, a few years ago. There was a time when I ministered in a church there and just helped in the foundation of a church, which now they've built a 10,000-seat auditorium. But I was, I was there when there were maybe 40, 50 people, 100 people. The next week, I, year, year I went back, Delia and I went back, there were like two or three hundred people, and the next year after that, there were several hundred people. It just uh, grew, and it's just amazing how quickly this church just blossomed and touched Accra, Ghana, and they're very well known in that city. But I remember the pastor saying to me, Paul said, tomorrow, to, tomorrow we're going to go to the bush to push. <laughs> now, the bush is their forest which is uh, made up of trees that would be kind of like our mesquite trees, maybe 20 feet high at the most, but the, they call that the forest. And so we went to the bush to push. That was how they called it in prayer. We're going to the bush to bush. I love the way they talk with the King's English and a Ghanaian accent to it. You know, it's just, we're going to the bush to push. And the next day, we went to the bush to push. It's 100 degrees even out there under the shade, what little shade you have. But there's a clearing, come into a clearing. It's probably about the size of this auditorium here, and there had to be no less than 250 people praying. You know when you're praying outside, it's hard to capture sound because everything's going up. But, but there was a roar coming from this 200 or 250 people. And the spirit of prayer was just, it, just incredible. Those of you that love to pray, you, you pray, you would, you would love something like this. You would, you would just love it. And uh, they were all walking around praying, very, a few kneeling, but for the most part, they're praying, and they're praying fervently, praying fervently. And then the sound would die down, and one of the prayer leaders would say, okay, now we are going to pray point number one. And the points that I had given the... Uh, the the night before, they use those points as prayer points, and then they begin to pray. And as I was, and so they did that several times. There's this rising crescendo of prayer, and then it settles down. And then the leaders would give another prayer point, and then they would all pray about that. You know, as I was standing there and I was watching this and being a part of this, 
and praying fervently in the Spirit as we were praying together. There's such a joy of being among this many voices praying. And actually, as we left, I heard other, I mean, there were a lot of churches that were gathering in different places. I, I think that whoever showed up first got the dubs on the best clearing area. But they were all over the place. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, this is why this nation is being evangelized so much. This is why you can walk down the street and see the unashamedly people uh, who recognize the Lord Jesus Christ, people who, who have gone through such opposition. This is the nation that was the first nation to get its independence from uh, colonial England. And, and so... I, I just sensed that the Lord was saying to me, Paul, this is what happens when people join together in prayer. And when we join together in prayer, y'all, God does things. He says if two or three agree. And I was thinking about this because, you know, uh, as a pastor you can, and, and, and a leader, you can get discouraged because you call for prayer and a few people show up. But this week, the Lord was showing me and reminded me of this, that Abraham, God said to Abraham, if you can find five people righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, I will spare the cities. It doesn't take a lot of people to get God to move. It doesn't make, take a lot of people to establish the will of God in an area. Three or four people can start praying, five people, and we had more than that, but, 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 but it doesn't take a lot. He says, if two or three agree is touching anything, it shall be. So I would encourage you, find people that you can pray with. Some of us are stumped. Sometimes we get to that place where our life is a mess. Some of us are in the middle of difficulties right now, and there's one thing that we can do, and that is that we can lift up our hearts together and pray and seek his face. So this is what they did. So first thing that I want, my first point here out of this passage is that praise is the gateway into his presence. The first thing that they did was they gave glory to God. Lord, you established all of this. And praise is more than singing. It's when the heart and the mouth declare the majesty and the preeminence of God. It, it, and that's a part of our calling on God. Psalm 104, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful and bless his name. Psalm 118, these gates lead to the presence of the Lord and the godly enter there. So when we come into service and we do sing together as one, when we are singing, I hope that we are embracing the words that we are singing. By the way, I love that new song today. But we, we're embracing the words that are being spoken and we transform them into declarations of truth. Whether it's a hymn, a psalm, or a spiritual song, let it be truth being emanated from us. So he goes on, and here's their part of their prayer. Lord, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. There's the second part, and that is that we remind God. Reminding God is a part of the petition. So reminding an all-knowing God who knows everything, he's omniscient, that's what all-knowing means, and that may seem strange to us. How, why, why would we remind God something that he already knows? So it's not as though the Lord forgets stuff, but he invites us, to remind him of his promises. I think that there is evidently something deep in the very heart of God that just responds when we remind him of the promises that he has made. And this is what they do. They remind him of what he has done. They remind him of what has happened in the past and how that the nations rose up, but they did so in vain. How the enemy came against them, but the plots of the enemy were destroyed. You know, when Solomon dedicated the temple, he gathered all of the people together. Solomon was the builder of the temple. 
the first great temple that was built. It was a magnificent structure, one of the seven wonders of the world. And when he got all of the people together, he prayed. And here's one of part of his prayer. Now, O Lord, he says, this is Second Chronicles 1, 9. Now, O Lord, let your promise to David, my father, be established. So what he does is he reminds him of the promises. See, there are times when you and I, as we're calling out upon the Lord, as we're seeking him, we need to look back and we need to remind him, Lord, you gave us this promise. Lord, we knew this was you. We knew this was you. And Lord, we remind you. It's not that God forgets, but we need to be reminded. So God had given uh, magnificent promises to the people of Israel. And so what now, now what Solomon was doing is he's appealing to the veracity of those promises and to the, the, the uh, credibility of God. Lord, you said. Everybody say, God, you said. It's okay to say that. Lord, this is what you have said. God perks up his ears and says, okay, you read it. You heard me. Lord, you said, and I think that's a, pair of, a, a power in our prayer when we look back at the word and said, God, you said it. And that is where we stand. When the, the Israelites were in Egyptian bondage, they were in slavery. Exodus 2.24, God heard their groaning. See, these people began to, the Bible says they cried out to the Lord in this situation. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not like God was absent-minded and that his people were there in slavery and that God just fooling around doing other things, and then one day, oh, what am I thinking? You know, he has that V8 moment. Oh, what am I thinking? And, and says, they're down there. I, I didn't mean to leave you guys. There. No, he saw them all the time. I keep looking down. I think God is everywhere. So he probably saw them all the time looking out there. And he knew where they were, but he remembered. What it means is that he, at that particular moment, he, goodbye, we'll see you all later. He, at that particular moment, he, he, uh, it's, it's another class going. It's a life group going on out in the room there. I'm sorry. But at that particular time, God said, okay, I'm going to focus special attention. Now is the time for things to take place. Now is the time for things to happen on behalf of them. So God is not absent-minded, but he does hear the cries of despair that reach his heart. And there are other passages about remembering his covenant. Now, I, I want us to move on in this passage in, uh, as they are praying together. This is, this is very interesting because this is kind of where uh, I would call it the rubber meets the road. They continue to pray, and here's they pray this. Lord, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. And they did what your power and will had decided be beforehand should happen. So I feel like what I want to get from this is that calling upon the Lord means stating our present situation. Here's where we are, Lord. Lord, we remember how you moved in the past. We remember all of that, but today, Lord, this is where we are. We're in this predicament right here. So sometimes we look to the past, we see what God has done in the past, but we say we have to define just what he's doing right here. And we're in the middle of it. We're in the middle of messes. Now, they even say this, you know, the government, the Roman government, has linked up with the Gentiles, and the Gentiles have linked up with religious leaders, and all of them. There's this synergy of opposition that has come against us right now. This is where we are. Here's where we are today. In America, we're, we're experiencing turmoil. We saw something happen this past week we have never seen before. We saw people storming 
into a place that is hallowed ground, at least in the, uh, in the annals of, of America, a place where laws are passed. We are ruled by law in America, and that is the place where it takes place. Whether you like it or not, that's the place where it happens. People stormed that place, went in and desecrated offices, and tore things apart. That's horrible. That's terrible. I don't care who ever does it. The publicans or the mocratics, you know, the you know, Bible says that a kid came home from church one day and said, Dad, uh, you know, I heard about Republicans today because uh, Jesus pointed out that there was a Republican beating his, uh, a, a, a poor man beating his chest and praying, but there was a publican, and the publican was, was uh, 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 thought he was superior to him. He said, no, that's not Republicans, that's a publican, that's a, like a public servant or whatever. Anyway, bad joke, look it up. And <laughs> We've seen stuff like this happen. Terrible. People dying, inequity, racial division, injustice, poverty, homelessness, suicide, COVID pandemic, for heaven's sakes. And it goes on and on. Things that we face, just good old-fashioned, downright stupidity, stuff that we face. This is our predicament, Lord. This is, I think that it's good for us to point to where the present situation is. We don't run from it. We, we state the problem. We bring it to him. You know, sometimes we don't get answers to prayers because we're not specific enough. We don't say, Lord, this is what's happened. Nor would you now move upon this. I had a friend many years ago. He fell out of the rafters of a barn onto a concrete floor, 12 feet up, landed on his head. He got up, said, I'm okay. His head began to swell, and they realized that he was not okay. Passed out. They got him to Utah, the University of Utah Hospital, and he was there. And they didn't think he would survive. And when we visited up there, we found a group of people had come all the way from a couple of hundred miles south from Parowan, Utah, and they were there. And primarily, his sister was the main prayer warrior. And I watched, I watched while I was there, I watched something that has taught me a lot of things about praying. But she would go and get an update from a doctor, and she would come in to this group of people, and she would say, it was just a small group, six or eight, 12 people, and she would say to them, what we need to do now is pray for this. And they prayed for that one specific thing. Then she would she'd get an update, and she kept getting the updates. And um, he lived, and, uh, and Dan Cowan went on and has lived a productive uh, life in ministry. Uh, but it was specific, specific. Get on down to it. What are you dealing with? What are we dealing with? So they get... Suspects, um, yeah, they, they look at it on purpose, yeah. I want to read a, a statement from this passage that really it's the big white elephant in the room usually, and we kind of pretend that it's not there. We skim over it. It's verse 28. They, speaking of all of the authorities, the Gentiles and everybody else, all of they, all of those people did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So what they say then is, Lord, all of this is a part of your will. All of this is a part of your plan. Now, that's big stuff right there. Can we accept that when things don't go the way we want them to, it's still a part of God's plan? Can we accept that there's a reason for all of this. You know, when everything's going our way, God is in this. When it's not going all our way, the devil, we're going to chase him out of here. But I want us to embrace this, that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. According to Romans, the 8th chapter, I don't care what happens. It cannot separate us from the love of God. Not separate us not from loving God, but cannot separate us from his love toward us. 
So we don't gauge God's love for us by how good or bad things happen. Nothing separates us from the love of God. I wish I could get an amen. <laughs> I know I can. <laughs> so they accepted what God had done, but they didn't leave it there. And this is where I begin to finish up. Acts, the fourth chapter, verse 29. Now, Lord, <laughs> we know that this has happened, but now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform uh, signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And I just want to finish by talking about this very quickly. And that is praying the now kind of prayer. In spite of the fact that we acknowledge that this present dilemma is a part of your plan that does not eliminate what we are planning to do. That does not eliminate our prayer. That does not eliminate us from coming, still coming before you and praying in now prayer. Lord, consider the threats. Now, Lord, move in this situation. Yes, Lord, you allowed all this to happen, but now we turn to you. We know that you're in the, you're in the process, and we also know you're in the business of reversing the curse. And to pour back on the head of the enemy all that has come against us, being willing to take a stand. Sometimes you... We need to draw a line in the sand and say, no more. No more. No more enemy. God, we're, we're not accepting this anymore now. It, it's got to change now. Uh, many years ago, our children were young. It was late, late one night, and I was praying. That's when we lived in the blue carpet house. And, and we called it the blue carpet house because it was all blue carpet. And when I say blue, it was really blue. I mean, it was blue. So the kids called it the blue carpet house, so we've always called it the blue carpet house. And the enemy came and began to speak to me. See, the enemy will speak to you in your mind. You just have to drive him out when he does. But I remember this. He said to you, he said to me, I, 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 and how did he see, I, this thought came to me, okay? That's how the enemy will speak through a thought. You and Delia are very dedicated, you're very consecrated, doing my will. Your children will not serve God. They will go another direction. i never forget that. And all of a sudden, this, I was, uh, this fear came over me. This fear, this potential reality of my daughter and my two sons turning their back on the Lord and going a different direction. And I began to pace the floor. And as I did, Faith began to rise in my heart, and I began to pray a now kind of prayer. Now, Lord, now. You need to pray those prayers. Every now and then, you know, we're, we're told to pray all the time, to be in prayer, but there's a, a certain time where God invites us to pray a now prayer. This is a prayer that is going to change everything. This is a prayer that is going to have eternal ramifications. I will never forget that night. I wish I had the date of that night. I'll never forget it. But I'd been on my, you know, doing carpet time with my nose to that blue carpet, praying and praying and praying, and, and also in fear. Have you ever prayed and you were doubting God at the same time? Yes, we all do that. But as I got up and I began to pace that floor, God began to allow faith to rise in my heart. And I thought of how devastation and destruction had come to my own family, How going down the Russell line, poverty, dismay, destruction, and all of that, all of that, all of that, all of that. And that night was the night that I said, okay, I'm drawing imaginary line in the sand, in the blue carpet, as it were, and I'm, I'm drawing, okay, and this is where it stops. It stops right here. It's not going to go any further. It's not going to go any further. And all of our children are serving God today. Yeah, amen. All of our children are serving God, and they're being effective wherever they are. 
And I thank God for that. But parents, you need to pray a now prayer for your family. And you know, my, my family was full of poverty. I, we couldn't live in a house without losing it. And that spilt over on me. And I remember we had a struggle, we had a struggle, we had a struggle. But there came a point in a time where I had to say, no more. There will be no more struggle. I didn't change anything. I just prayed the prayer. I just put it out there. Now, Lord, hear their threatenings. And let your hand be upon your people that signs and wonders may be done put you in the middle of a city or a town or a village or a, a country where you know no one and you can pray your way to success. You can pray your way into whatever needs to be done because there is nothing. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the church is you. Everybody say, the church is me. <laughs> I am the church, and nothing shall prevail against me. So I just make that declaration today that God is going to use you to do mighty things for his glory. Amen. And you will succeed. You will not fail. You will succeed. But you have to take that, and on the basis of that reality, that truth from God's word, then make that declaration for you and for your family. I hope that encourages you today. Pray the now kind of prayer. One more scripture. And after they prayed, it says the place where they were meeting was shaken. <laughs> we don't know where they were meeting. Now, they could have been. They were still allowed to go into the temple, so it may have been there. Now, obviously, it wasn't the upper room. There's not enough room there for that. But they were someplace. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and spoke the word of God boldly. Let's pray. Father, 